screen because I have some slides to accompany that I am going to walk through. Okay, can you see that? Great. Um, okay, well, hi everyone. Um, as Sabrina said, I'm Katie and I am the Executive Director of the Future Coalition. Um, the Future Coalition is a network of youth-led organizations and youth organizers from across the country. So essentially what we do is we act as a connective tissue between youth activists who are organizing in their communities and provide them resources that traditionally have only been available to adult-led organizing. Um, so a lot of our work, as Sabrina mentioned, is centered around climate justice, specifically the climate strikes, which I'll explain a little bit more in a minute. But before I dive into that, I want to share a little bit about how we started, because I think it sort of helps to give a sense of, of what we do and, and, and why we do it. Um, so we actually, the initial idea for Future Coalition came about in June of 2018 in the wake of the rise of youth organizing that was happening around gun violence prevention um, after the shooting in Parkland, Florida. Uh, and we, uh, there was a few gun violence prevention organizers at the time that um, sort of started to have conversations about the movement and sort of how there was so much energy and then a lot of it um, sort of there was very little support to keep that energy going. And we realized that there really wasn't any space for young people and youth activists to collaborate and to work together. And there were very few resources uh, for young people to do the work that they wanted to do to the level that they wanted to do it. And so we created Future Coalition to address this problem specifically in the gun violence prevention space. But as soon as we started, we realized that the challenges that were facing youth gun violence organizers were the same challenges facing all youth organizers, no matter what issue that they were working on. People didn't have what they need, the resources and the funding to do their work, and people weren't connected with each other and didn't feel like they necessarily had a community um, to uh, sort of be a part of um, and, and kind of a, a broader team um, to organize in. Uh, and so we created Future Coalition ahead of the 2018 midterm elections um, just to sort of try out what it would look like to bring so many groups together um, and, and collaborate. And it was really successful and people really enjoyed it. And so we decided that we wanted to make Future Coalition um, something that sort of could continue providing that infrastructure to youth organizers. And kind of as 2018 wound down and 2019 started, we started to see a real shift in um, organizing that young people do, were doing from gun violence prevention and other issues to climate being really this defining issue of, of what our generation was working on, not just in the United States, but around the world. And so we realized that in the US, we were able to sort of provide to the movement what we wish had existed at the beginning of the gun violence prevention kind of up, up, um, upsurge in energy. Uh, and so we uh, right away sort of started connecting with um, groups on the ground that were doing climate strikes around the March 15th climate strike um, in 2019. Um, and then very quickly realized that there was sort of a need for a greater infrastructure in the US for uh, youth climate organizing and youth climate strike organizing so that not only the youth-led organizations were collaborating and working together, but there were also bridges being built between youth-led organizations and adult-led organizing. And that we were connecting kind of this new wave of energy around youth climate justice organizing with what has been the climate environmental justice movement for the last many decades. Um, and so sort of from that, we decided to create the Climate Strike Coalition, which is where a lot of future coalitions climate works exists in. Um, and the Climate Strike Coalition is a coalition made up of over 500 organizations, both youth-led and adult-led, that collaborate to plan the climate strikes. So we formed ahead of the September 20th climate strikes last year um, and have since worked on the strikes, the November 29th and December 6th strikes. And then we're planning for the Earth Day climate strikes um, at the end of April, but had to quickly pivot to make those digital, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but all to say is that over the last um, now more than year, which is crazy, uh, we have been working to really provide a space for young people and adults to come together and really have authentic intergenerational collaboration so that we can build up a movement um, that is not just youth led, but that is intergenerational, intersectional and always. Um, and so I'm really excited with the work that we've done over the last year. I'm really excited how the climate movement right now is showing up for the movement for black lives. 
um, on the streets and also nationally. Um, and I'm really excited to see sort of as we build towards the election and in 2021, sort of where we can continue to take this youth energy that's been growing over the last few years. Um, so sort of since COVID, um, COVID-19 obviously for like it was for so many were um, really kind of a uh, uh, was a, 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 a was a caused us to have to pivot as we kept saying um, in many ways um, we actually about a week um, ahead of sort of when everything started happening mid March was about a week ahead of when we were supposed to hold um, a big convening for a bunch of youth activists in um, Puerto Rico with uh, a few Gen Cleo young people as well um, which was really disappointing that we had to cancel um, so that was one of the first things that had to sort of be moved and then the biggest thing for us was we as I had mentioned were initially planning sort of a three-day climate strike um, that was supposed to happen from April uh, 22nd the, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day to April 24th and so we knew um, about mid-March that we were going to have to make this pivot away from these three-day climate strikes. Uh, and we spent about a week having just conversations with folks on the ground, other organizers in the coalition, to get a sense of what people wanted to do and how we could really be creative and use that moment to sort of reimagine what, how our social movement was being built and sort of what tools that we were using. Um, and so from there, we decided to, uh, instead of holding the three-day climate strike in person, have a three-day digital strike called Earth Day Live, um, which was uh, three days of um, conversations and trainings and dialogues and musical performances and just a, a whirlwind of lots of different um, events, which was really amazing and really gave us a chance to bring people together in a way that we wouldn't have been able to in person. Um, and we also sort of kind of got an opportunity to learn really quickly a lot of digital lessons um, that we may not have otherwise learned um, uh, that we've been able to sort of continue to take with us and build. Um, and so while it was a crazy shift um, and a bit of a stressful one, uh, it allowed us to um, kind of have a crash course in what we needed to know sort of now as we're continuing to transition to digital organizing, as well as figuring out how we can support those in the streets right now with digital organizing. Um, so since sort of Earth Day Live, we've been having lots of conversations with our network around how we can support in the lead up to the election, um, as well as the work that's happening around movement for Black lives on the ground and what's the role in both the climate movement and the broader youth movement in um, supporting uh, work um, from Black leaders across the country. Um, so from kind of what we've been working on, I have put together a couple of sort of key lessons uh, from our kind of online activism and an event that uh, I have personally learned, um, but I'm definitely no expert, so I'm constantly learning. Um, but a few kind of top line things. The first is that um, a lot of people know a lot of things about digital organizing. And so the first thing that we did when we were when we were planning Earth Day Live was talk to a bunch of people that had done things similar. Um, for example, Climate Reality Project has a 24 hour live stream that they do every year. And so we had a conversation with them, sort of learn best practices. Um, and that sort of continuing to be something that we're doing is just having conversations with people that know things that we don't, especially as young people, um, knowing that um, some of those hard skills we can sometimes learn from folks that have been working for longer. Um, the second thing is that stories are really powerful, especially when they're communicated, when we can't communicate face to face, having really um, captivating and interesting stories in other ways um, is, is, um, is uh, very powerful, um, especially when they're coming from different voices and they're sort of bringing different voices and different stories together, which is something that Earth Day Live did. So we were able to bring um, Jane Fonda as an example, who obviously has, you know, has been doing climate activism, but is sort of known for her work in film, um, and Vanessa Nakate, who is a climate activist from Uganda, and we were able to bring them together for a conversation, um, sort of bringing their stories and their paths together, which was really, really powerful. Um, we did learn that people can remember less um, than an in-person event, and so we have to make sure that we're very clear in our call to action. So one call to action is our probably our biggest takeaway from Earth Day Live, that having a single call to action instead of a lot is uh, really key. Um, also keeping accessibility top of mind and making sure that 
we're thinking about it's accessibility in many different ways. That is both, you know, if folks are tuning into a live stream or something like that, if we have closed captioning, captions um, or other things for folks that sort of need to translations as well that are engaging in the digital content, but need to engage with, engage with it in a slightly different way. And then accessibility when it comes to just accessibility to technology in the first place and making sure that we're doing everything we can to close that accessibility gap and also get offering everything we're offering digitally in other ways. Um, uh, reframing measuring of success is another key one. That was something that we learned during Earth Day Live that something in person is not going to look the same as something digital and success is going to be different. So we may not have um, 7 million people mobilizing, we might just have 4 million people tuning in. But for Earth Day, we saw more than double the social media impressions that we saw from the September 20th climate strikes. And so we were able to sort of look at those measurements of success and say, okay, we weren't as, as successful or it was not successful in the same way around some things, but other pieces were more successful and sort of gave us a chance to reach people in a new and different way. Um, and then know when it's time to power down is the last one, because I think that is a really key one, especially for young people and especially for young people who are doing organizing and activism work so much. I know for me, my social media feed is basically always just about politics or about organizing or about activism and that can get really um, overwhelming sometimes when you know I'm working all the time and then also looking at it in social media and reading the news and so um, just knowing when it's time to just shut things off and just take a break and knowing that that is um, a really key thing in all organizing spaces but especially right now when we're organizing so much digitally um, and and are not having that same face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so that's a little bit kind of of what I've learned and our team has learned over um, the last few months and weeks. We're still learning and still doing lots of different things. Um, a few ways to stay connected with us. Um, you can follow us on social media. Um, and uh, we um, keep our social media up to date with everything that we're working on. And then the other thing in what I spoke about in the beginning is that Future Coalition, you know, our role, we really see it as being the organizer of the organizer. So we're very rarely will ever say, you know, everyone should go do this or everyone should go do this. But we really just want to show up and support young people wherever they are and with whatever they need. So especially for young folks or folks that work with young people, see us really as, uh, as an ally and an asset. And if there's any, anything you ever need, um, whether it be, um, you know, small funding for an event or um, training on something or um, someone to help you design a website, uh, let us know and we can be helpful. Um, just one quick call out I will make is that we, the Youth Climate Strike Coalition, which sort of sits at the center of the Climate Strike Coalition, is made up of eight youth-led organizations that coordinate the climate strikes. We have a fund originally called the Youth Climate Action Fund that was for, formed ahead of the September 20th climate strikes that just a week and a half ago, we decided to rename to the Youth Direct Action Fund so that we could support organizers who are organizing, um, even if they're not organizing specifically around climate. So folks who are specifically right now doing movement for Black Lives work, being able to support folks through that fund. So um, if anyone uh, is doing work on the ground right now and needs funding, that is definitely a place to um, check out uh, and makes it really easy for, for young people to apply and get funding. Um, so yeah, again, I just want to thank you all so much for having me on and letting me share a little bit about our work. Um, definitely learning lots of lessons as we go and, and we'll definitely learn lots more um, as we sort of continue heading toward the election and beyond. Um, so thanks so much and I'll pass it back to Bruno. Thank you, Katie. I'm now going to hand it off to Rebecca, who will give a presentation on the work that climate mobilization has been doing. Thanks so much, uh, Sabrina. I'm really excited to be in this space with you today. Um, and thanks so much, Katie. It was really great um, hearing about your work with Future Coalition as well. Um, so my name's Rebecca. You see her pronouns and the organizing director at the Climate Mobilization. And just to share a little bit about our work, we support people in 100 communities in the U.S. and Canada who are pushing their local governments to respond to the climate emergency by committing to reach zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. And we're working also to build a movement across organizations. Uh, more than 85 of the campaigns we work with are actually run by partner organizations like Clio Institute. And we've been honored to work with Clio Institute on a number of climate emergency campaigns across the state of Florida as well. 
We also help individuals plug in to the push to respond to the climate emergency by joining a team or by starting a local group in their communities. So our name, the climate mobilization, comes from the idea that we need to direct the same amount of resources towards climate change that the U.S. has historically directed uh, towards its military, right? We know that during World War II, um, America mobilized all of its resources towards the war effort. Um, and we believe that today we need the same level of investment as this historical example shows us is possible, but we need these resources to be directed towards protecting life. We believe that we need significant federal spending, strong regulations, and for the government to redirect the consumer economy so that we can create a safe climate for ourselves and for the future. We're also part of a worldwide movement. Um, to date, there have been more than 1,500 climate emergency declarations passed. Uh, and a number of those have been passed by Gen Clio participants as well. Um, and worldwide, climate emergency declarations are helping name the seriousness of the climate crisis, helping people understand what the risks are that we face, that it is an emergency. Um, and in the US, through our work at the climate mobilization, we are working to make sure these declarations are turned into promises that elected officials are making. We're working to make sure that organizers around the U.S. are actually holding accountable um, local officials, county officials, state officials who say that we're in an emergency and making sure that they actually follow up um, on those actions and on that recognition as well, right? Getting elected officials to promise to end greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and then pushing them to, to see that it's implemented and followed through on. During the pandemic, there are four main areas that we have been focusing on. First and most important is support and training for the organizers that we work with. We work with a lot of volunteer-led climate emergency campaigns around the U.S. And we've been doing everything we can to try and push support, push resources towards the grassroots. Um, and I just, following what Katie said, I uh, want to reemphasize that we at the Climate Mobilization as well um, have an open door, open inbox, open phone uh, policy for anybody that wants to brainstorm with us around support for a climate emergency campaign, for an organizing project. Um, really supporting organizers like you is what we do and is, is why we're here. We've also been joining rapid response efforts led by other groups that have been pushing for a just response to the pandemic um, and also joining in solidarity with the movement for Black Lives. So, you know, for instance, we signed on to the set of five principles for a just bailout that the People's Bailout Group put forward a few months back. Um, we joined a People Not Polluters Day of Online Action. We signed on to the Rewind Act, which is a bill in Congress that would prevent bailout funds from going to fossil fuel companies. And um, we did an online action event uh, as part of that with the ClimateEmergency.us Coalition. And more recently, we've signed on to the Movement for Black Lives, 619 mobilization for Juneteenth. That is actually this weekend. Um, and so I'd love to take a moment and um, just share that information. If any of you are looking to get involved with that this weekend, um, showing up to support the movement for Black Lives, you can find more information on that at 619.com. And that's all spelled out. Another important piece of work for us during the pandemic has been what I would call the invisible parts of organizing. I think that a lot of the time we might think of organizing and think about just the public pieces of it, the protests, the news conferences, the meetings with elected officials. Um, but it's been our experience at climate mobilization um, that actually what's even more important are the relationships and the structures and the intentionality and the reflection that that 
organizing rests on and is built on. And so we've been also doing a lot of internal work to really strengthen ourselves and our systems and our processes so that as things have you know, slowed down just a little, um, we're, we're going to be able to, once things get back up to full speed, um, come back stronger and have a stronger foundation. And part of that is what I'm going to say next, which is around strategizing for the future. Um, we believe it's really important to take seriously the situation that we're in with the climate emergency and the level of the risks that we face. Um, and if we, you know, really take seriously the fact that we're in the fight of our lives, that means we need to be thoughtful and strategic and make sure we're fighting to win and um, make sure that, you know, even as we face the urgency of the climate crisis, that we're slowing down enough to make well thought out plans, that we are really just um, being intentional and being strategic um, and setting ourselves up to, uh, to win in these fights. So stay tuned, there may be more uh, news coming from us in the next couple of months um, around some of the pieces that come out of this. Next, I'm gonna share just a little bit about our experiences with online organizing. The biggest lesson I have learned through online organizing is just the incredible need to make it personal. People need to feel valued and feel listened to um, now more than ever during this time of pandemic. And one of the, I'm gonna share some different ways that we have done online organizing. One of the most important pieces of work that we found is foundational to, for us is actually to take the time to do one-on-one -on -one meetings with members of groups, um, with people who are just starting to show up, um, with people who might be open to taking on a leadership role in this work, but to really just take the time to get to know everyone as individuals, even if it's happening over the phone. Um, we have found that that is really what creates the glue um, for us that we can use to build any um, larger digital organizing event or campaign. We've also been seeing a lot of the groups that we work with that are meeting online, use some of that time to hold strategy sessions and to really think about how is it that we are gonna get from where we are now with our campaign to where we need to be in order to win? And how is it that we're going to use our power to get what we need out of the elected officials that we're working to push? In addition, um, we have held and seen some of the campaigns we work with hold mass meetings, um, town halls, rallies, um, oftentimes paired uh, with an online action for folks to do while they are gathered together. And we've seen this be a really effective um, tool for digital organizing, right? Um, some recommendations quickly on best practices around having these online rallies and events um, is to have a call to action, just like Katie said, one call to action. And we've noticed it's a lot more effective if we actually give people time to do the action on the call. We pause, we really make them do it, and really to have some sort of accountability for that, right? So for folks to list off in the chat box that they've done the action, um, for us to watch in some ways on the online forum, see how many people have done the action, so we can keep pushing uh, people that might be on the line to act. And that's something about online organizing, right, and these online events, is we really have to make sure that, you know, people are engaging. Um, sometimes, you know, we've all been in those online meetings where there's the temptation to tune out, there's the temptation to multitask, and anything we can do in these online spaces um, to really check in on how people are engaged is to our benefit. Um, we've also uh, done some online petitions, some call-in, write-in, and email-in actions um, along with those online mass meetings. Um, one thing we have noticed, though, is social media actions can, can often be tricky. Um, we have found that as a small national organization or um, with some of the local campaigns we work with, 
it often feels like a good idea to do a social media action, um, and, but it can often be challenging for us to really, um, as a smaller organization, get the shares and the traction lined up that we need for that action to be successful. Um, so really encourage anyone doing a social media action to have a concrete plan, pledges in place for people who have promised to share in, in advance, ideally pages, influencers with a large audience um, that have uh, pledged to share uh, the social media action in order to really make an impact. And some tips for success uh, for online actions. First is that we find there's sometimes a hurdle where people don't believe an online action can be as impactful. Um, and so we found with online organizing, it's even more important to have a really clear case about why it will make a difference. And then also have exciting speakers to draw people in for that motivation factor. And that's something Earth Day Live did really, really well. Um, also, making sure to set a goal, right, for how many people we want to contact at their elected official during the online action. Um, we've noticed generally with online stuff, we often have a third to a fifth of the people that RSVP show up. So factoring that in um, in planning. And then something we've really learned um, about online organizing throughout the last, last while is online means using a phone just as much as ever. Just like for an in-person event, you have to do turnout, make reminder calls, make reminder text messages, send reminder emails. Um, for an online event, it's exactly the same and people need the same amount of reminders to show up. Sometimes even more reminders, it seems like. Another lesson learned is to ask for commitment um, and to always have a clear next step for people that show up to an online space. Um, we like to, to collect commitments at the climate mobilization using the chat box so that people don't have to leave the Zoom room, um, don't have to go, don't have to click on anything in order to be connected with that next step. So I was asked to share a little bit about how folks can get involved in the climate mobilization. Um, I think one of the best ways to get involved is to join Gen Clio in working on passing or implementing a climate emergency declaration. I know there's a number of uh, climate emergency campaigns that Gen Clio works with around Florida. Um, for those who are looking um, to do something individually as well, um, we also have a couple of teams that are open to folks joining. We have a get together team of people who are working to plan online discussions around the climate emergency and an action team of people who are working to push members of Congress to take action um, around the climate emergency. And if you're interested in either of those, please say so uh, in the chat box. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm excited to get be in conversation um, with with all of you. Thank you, Rebecca. Now I'm going to invite the audience members to submit your questions to our two panelists in the chat box, or please raise your hand if you want to ask the question live through video. So I'm going to start off with some questions. Um, Katie, how can we integrate Black Lives Matter in climate activism? Um, yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Um, well, I, as I mentioned sort of in my speech, I'm really excited about how the climate movement and the climate justice movement is showing up for Black Lives Matter right now. Um, I think it's so important that people understand how these two fights and, I, and in general, all of everything that has to do with social justice is um, so linked and that by supporting each other and showing up for each other, we are working toward our collective win, um, especially when it comes to climate change. Climate change is an, an issue that disproportionately affects Black people in this country um, as 
most issues are, if you're talking about gun violence, if you're talking about um, women's rights, um, if you're talking about healthcare, Black people are disproportionately affected by all of these issues. And so as movements, especially as the climate justice movement that has said for so long that we want to show up for those at the front lines and we want to make sure that we're centering um, BIPOC folks in the organizing that we're doing, this is that time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's time for, for us to, to show up, even if it doesn't mean that we're hitting goals that we set out as our movement in January. So much has changed that um, we really have to be showing up last night, or we have to be showing up. Last night, there was a call um, that a number of climate groups held um, in support of Movement for Black Lives and for Juneteenth, which um, Rebecca mentioned uh, it, that is happening um, on Friday and this weekend. Um, and uh, there was, they maxed out the Zoom. There was over a thousand people on the call and there was every time somebody dropped off, somebody new came on. Um, and uh, the folks that spoke on that call, um, they did an excellent job of putting together the content that was talking about movement for black lives, but specifically in the context of climate. And one of the things that they said was as, as climate and especially as sort of the environmental world that for a really long time has looked a very, a certain way. And that's been old and male and white um, that for a lot of folks, it's time right now to be quiet, listen and show up. And, um, you know, we have uh, different folks in the climate space have a lot to offer as far as resources and trainings and just organizers on the ground. And so our job right now is to, to listen and, and to show up. Um, and, and that for us at Future Coalition is what we've been doing is talking to folks in the field and just getting a sense of what they need and how we can sort of support those needs. And I think no matter what level of organizing you're working on, that is, I think applies is, um, you know, figure out whether it's in your local community or in sort of your activism sphere who's doing the movement for black lives organizing work and show up and say how can you help um and, and i think also i'm really excited to see sort of over the next couple of months how this uh informs sort of our work in like on the more climate side of climate justice as well um because i think it you know the youth movement in particular has said and has really intentionally been working over the last year to um start to really kind of live out those what we have been saying over the last years and years of centering BIPOC folks, centering folks who are most on the front lines, not just in the stories, but in their leadership. And I think that um, we'll continue to see that. And this is pushing people even more to examine white supremacy, how white supremacy is affecting, how they're perpetuating white supremacy in their own life and in their workspace um, and how we can sort of collectively build um, our movement and sort of movements across the, the, the range of issues um, to not just fight for the issues that we're working on, but fight for them in the line, lens of justice and in the lens of, um, of, 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 of Black lives. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I'd say, be quiet and show up um, is probably the best thing. Um, and um, and uh, um, yeah, and I think also the other thing that I'll say just in the realm of digital is um, that what's really powerful about the movement now, movement for Black Lives now that I think we have yet to um, see in this country in the last few years around an issue is this sustained energy on social media around movement for Black Lives. and folks that I'm seeing outside of like the normal organizing sphere continually even, you know, continuing now to post on their social media that, you know, social media right now, the space is, is not, it shouldn't be for posting, you know, pictures of, of all the interesting things that people are doing in quarantine, but is really a space for education and is a space for um, awareness and advocacy. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that is also something that we can see continue and that people recognize that social media can't make all of the change, but it can be such an important tool in that sort of amplification and pushing of that narrative. Um, and so I think that we have the chance of continuing to harness social media to be really effective in raising awareness and in, in getting people to show up. Um, and I'll just drop this link in the chat again, which is the one that Rebecca mentioned, which is um, what is happening this weekend. And it has a map of events across the country um, um, for Juneteenth and, and all the events that are happening both in person and for folks that um, can't or are not comfortable doing in-person events can also um, uh, take part in digital mobilizations. Thank you, Katie. Rebecca, this question is for you. Considering these sensitive times, when do you think is a good time to try and pass the climate emergency declaration?
thanks for asking that. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, you know, I think that there are, I think there is organizing work to be done regardless of whether it is a moment that a climate emergency declaration can and should be in the spotlight or not. Um, I think just harking back to what I said about invisible organizing work and the importance of building a strong foundation. Um, I think that if you're an organizer who feels like it is not the right moment to be working on passing a climate emergency declaration, um, there's a lot that you can be doing that can build towards addressing the climate emergency um, a little bit later down the road. You can take this time to show up in solidarity with other organizations. Um, you can take this time to build stronger relationships within your group. You can take this time to work on strategy and planning um, and outreach. So I think, um, I, I guess just to say that like the slice of organizing that is about talking to elected officials, getting their attention, getting the attention of the media, is just kind of a small slice of the organizing pie. And I wanna make sure that we're, that we're able to, uh, for lack of a better metaphor, um, enjoy the whole organizing pie and, uh, and build stronger campaigns um, because of it. And um, I, would encourage, I would encourage anyone that thinks the timing isn't right to um, hold a public event, to approach an elected official, to, to take that seriously. Um, and to think about, you know, how they can be in solidarity with other groups, uh, other organizations in their community, and also um, what, what other types of organizing they can do. Thank you, Rebecca. Following up on that, how do you recommend we proceed to talk about the climate emergency declaration with city commissioners during this time? Um, how how you talk about it during this time. I think, you know, I think what Katie was saying about making connections between climate and the many issues that it is related to is really key. Grounding our climate work in struggles for justice is really key. Um, I also think though that if we're going to make those connections, um, it's really important for those connections to be grounded in real rela organizational relationships and, and real coalition building. Um, so I think making those connections is important um, when, we're, when we're advocating for a declaration, but I also, uh, I, it's just, it's critical that that, that that be really representing work that we are doing as climate organizers to build relationships across organizations and, and build coalitions that um, represent the struggles for justice happening in this moment. Thank you, Rebecca. Katie. This question is for you. How do you get people to come to your strikes? Ooh, that is an, uh, a hard question. Um, I would say that outreach and like getting people to show up is one of the hardest things. I think it's going to be really interesting and there's been a lot of conversations within the Youth Climate Strike Coalition, which I men mentioned earlier about how the protests that we're seeing now around movement for Black Lives is going to affect how we protest for the next couple of years because the energy that we're seeing right now is so different than, in a good way, is so different than what we've seen for climate or for gun violence prevention in the last couple of years. Um, and that um, we, that like harnessing the energy will happen differently. And so I'm really curious to see how it will evolve. But I think in general, um, like relational outreach is the best, meaning like getting people to bring their friends and getting their friends to bring all of their friends. Um, and what we're finding in the, like in transitioning to digital that we're able to use tools that really help with that. Um, in a way that we weren't able to pre-pandemic. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer texting is a big one that a lot of folks have not used before, but are are starting to use now, which um, essentially is like an app that allows you to mass text people, but individually. So you can send out 
text and answer text really quickly. Um, and so that's a tool that can be used for outreach and for connecting. It's a lot of campaigns use it or for voter registration or things like that. And so my hope is that by using this tool, these tools, as well as kind of other tools that allow you to um, practice kind of that relational organizing will kind of carry over into when we move back into like more in person, because I think that is a really effective way um, to getting people to want to be involved is getting people's friends to ask them to get involved. Um, and that's what we're seeing on social media now too. going back to that, that earlier point is that, you know, when all of your friends are doing it, you do it as well. And so, um, yeah, I would say the biggest thing is the relational piece. And then um, I think it's, you know, how do you market a protest or how do you market an action? Um, I think a lot has to do with, with branding and, and distribution um, and just getting it into the most hands of people as possible. Thank you so much, Katie. Rebecca, what do you think is the best way to spread the message of the climate crisis in communities? Building on what Katie was, was just saying, I actually really think that working through relationships um, is the best way, right? And that can look like working through our existing relationships, um, whether through an app or whether just the low tech way of having ourselves and others in our group literally make a list of everyone we know, all of the groups and communities that we're part of where we have connections to. Um, working through those relationships um, and then also working to build new relationships right through one-on-one -on -one meetings with people that folks in our network can introduce us to or by reaching out intentionally um, and building with um, with organizations um, in our community um, and then I think once we have those relationships once we have talk to folks about this, um, working, working with people we know to, to spread the word. I think that's one of the most effective things we can do. Thank you, Rebecca. Question for Katie. So Earth Day Live was amazing, but that was probably required a lot of fundraising. How do you think is an appropriate way to fundraise now during the pandemic for an organization you work for? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, fundraising is always difficult, but definitely COVID has made it even more difficult. Um, we were really lucky in that for Earth Day Live in particular, because there was so much uncertainty around that time in March and many groups had no idea what they were doing. Um, and what was so great about the Climate Check Coalition and about, I think, the youth movement in general is that we were able to so quickly change course and be built, be very nimble. And so the reason I think we got a lot of excitement and that there were a lot of partner organizations that were really excited to plug in was because nobody had any clue what they were doing or what was going on. And Earth Big Live was something concrete that people could work on and really sort of have something to look forward to. And I think that translated into funding as well. Um, so funders sort of who, were, who fund the climate space and, um, you know, were, were also sort of realizing that a lot of what they were funding was needing to change and, and how they were funding needed to change. Um, and so had a few folks that were really eager to support. Um, on the flip side, I think we now that sort of that that moment has finished. And I think both because of where we are and where we're headed as a country economically, um, fundraising is a lot more difficult. Um, and I think that it will, you know, that will continue to be a challenge. Um, I think that there is uh, a lot of energy from my understanding, at least in kind of the philanthropic community, um, given what's happening as, as close we are with the elections, everything that's going on with COVID, um, and the fact that, you know, we're not seeing an, an economic relief package for folks that is, is, is even close to what we would need to, to um, uh, sort of continue a sustainable economy. Um, as well as um, um, I think what's happening with Movement for Black Lives is that folks are really, folks in the sort of fundraising space are really sort of starting to see that there's a lot of, that the, the social justice and organizing spaces are in need of funding. Um, and so I think that I'm hopeful that folks will continue to fund. Um, the one thing I would say about fundraising that I've noticed, and I've heard feedback from folks who are on the ground for Movement for Black Lives and something that we really struggled with 
with the climate strikes and one of the reasons that we created this youth direct action fund which i spoke to earlier um, is that a lot of times funding goes to these big national organizations and isn't actually ending up with the at the grassroots um, and that is what we're seeing that a lot of folks who are you know amazing black-led community grassroots orgs that are working right now on mobilizing aren't actually seeing an uptake in their funding um, and so I think uh, that is something that I think is, you know, a problem in many spaces is that, you know, a couple of these big national orgs get funding and it doesn't end up at the grassroots. And so something that we actively um, try to work on um, uh, and, and, and try to support. And I think just to, to, to your question, Asher, sort of about um, what's an appropriate way, I think, for orgs like us that are national but are are not institutional i guess for lack of better words like that we support the grassroots and that we operate more in a grassroots model is the i think uh, the best way for us to fundraise right now and how we practice is try to get as much money as we can directly to the folks on the ground who are doing the work um and that's sort of how we do all of our fundraising is that we sort of are are are, are doing on a shoestring and trying to get as much money to the folks who are doing the work as as much as possible um and that's what we'll continue to do uh sort of leading up to the election and, and around um movement and black lives work thank you katie rebecca how do you navigate mental health with everything going on on top of climate anxiety Thanks for asking that, Sabrina. Um, I think I try to navigate mental health by doing something each day to just like disengage and step away from the screen. Um, I think for me, um, it also comes down to just like trying to check off the basics for myself each day, right? Am I going to sleep at a reasonable hour? Am I getting some time to go outside and walk around um, every day in the morning, which is especially important in this time when so many of us can't leave our houses very much? Um, am I taking the time to set up phone dates with friends every week? Um, am I just checking in with myself about how I really feel? So for me, it's just it's about the basics. Um, and just trying to lay that as a foundation so that I can be effective. And the truth is, in times, I have noticed in times when I get really busy and let those things slide, I am not able to work effectively to be present um, with my colleagues um, or uh, with the folks I'm, I'm working with. So I see that as just like the foundation for anything else that I do. Thank you, Rebecca. Katie. Who or what inspired you to get started? Um, ooh, that's a good question. So the first, I I have like my, the, I have a few different kind of stories growing up that I remember kind of realizing that, that organizing was something that I wanted to do. Um, but my favorite story is when I was in fourth grade and my gym teacher in fourth grade used to make like boys and girls play separately for contact sports. So when you play like basketball or soccer or things like that. Um, and I always thought the boys would, was, were, was having, were having more fun than the girls. And so, um, convinced my whole class that we should stage a sit in to make our gym teacher allow us to all play together. And I think at the time, like my class, most people didn't even really understand what I was asking people to do. I just had a petition that I had everyone sign. And then we all just went to gym and sat down and refused to get up, uh, until, um, he would comply with our, comply with our demands. Um, and he eventually did give given and from that point on we all used to play together um, and so I think that that for me definitely was kind of the moment before I knew like what organizing was or anything like that where I um, was was sort of found myself organizing something um, and sort of really sparked my interest in just understanding that as an individual or as a collective we have the ability to, to change something if we don't like it um, so that was kind of my first experience in organizing. Thank you Katie. Rebecca, do you have anything you want to add for who or what inspired you to get started? Yeah, in terms of getting started in organizing, I think one of my first memories was when I was like four years old, my mom was actually really involved um, in trying to get our city to fund the library system better. Um, and I remember her going to meetings um, getting me involved, having me like draw pictures um, for 
uh, the campaign for some reason. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why she wanted me as a four year old drawing pictures. I can't imagine it was it was useful in any way. Uh, but um, she just, you know, really engaged me from a young age. And I think show, showed me like the, that it was important to her to use her voice. Um, and as I, as I got older, um, in high school, I think just as I became more aware, um, of, of things happening in the world and, um, became aware of the, the U S, um, launching an, an unjust war in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, was, really fortunate to to have others in my community that supported me and and welcomed me um into doing organizing for peace um when i was in 10th grade um and uh it really really made made all the difference for me to be part of a of a community that helped me learn and grow during that time thank you rebecca katie what are some positive effects that have resulted from climate activism during the pandemic? And what are strategies that you are going to integrate from this experience when everything is back to normal again? That's a really great question. I think, um, hmm. I think that um, I, I think I've noticed in the youth climate movement that I think it's sort of starting at the beginning of sort of when COVID happened, but I also think it also has to do the timeline is when Bernie dropped out of presidential race as well. I think that those two things happening kind of around the same time really affected the youth climate movement and I think is going to continue to sort of affect the trajectory that we're heading in. Um, and I think part of what it was was I think people really felt like, you know, we there was all this energy and all this build up about, you know, the big existential crisis about climate change. And we were sort of getting to that point where people were starting to understand climate change as this, as the emergency that it is. Um, and I think with COVID, COVID happening caused the, you know, most pressing issue in people's mind, the biggest existential threat to no longer be climate and instead to be COVID. And so I think that distracted people in some ways, but I think um, in many ways, I, it, it, it definitely obviously changed the direction of, of our movement and sort of the trajectory and the path that we're going to take to, to win. Um, but I think that happening at the same time of Bernie dropping out, I think left a lot of youth feeling very, I'll speak just for youth because those are the folks that I work with most, I think the adult world is a little bit different, but um, for the youth, I think folks were feeling very, you know, burnt out and I think frustrated and a little bit defeated. Um, but I think that over the last few weeks around what's been happening with Movement for Black Lives, I think folks have sort of been kind of re, um, just like refreshed and a little bit, um, I think, like re re-inspired under what what it means when we talk about a revolution because i think that was what you know i'm not sure if i'm allowed to talk about this if this is 2c4 for this conversation but i'm just gonna say it anyways is that um we had um is that i think part of the reason young people and youth climate gravitated so much to bernie was that you know bernie was running not to defeat trump but was running for a revolution that was like the whole thing and i think that people tied our collective revolution to bernie and i think what people are realizing now is that sort of now that that's happened and that people have had time to frankly grieve about you know that what's been lost is people have realized that we don't need or really it shouldn't even be that the presidential candidate is the person who's leading the revolution and it should be the people that are leading, leading the revolution. And I think that that's what we're seeing on the streets right now is that, you know, this is a people led revolution. And that is what to me is really inspiring. And I think is what is going to give us as young people the energy we need to carry on the fight for, um, you know, not just, uh, you know, Black, you know, for black lives and, and for, um, you know, police brutality and for defunding the police, but also for all the issues that affect our generation. My hope is that we carry this energy to the election and that young people show up with a historic youth voter turnout. And, you know, on November 4th, hopefully, or whenever the election results get a release that, um, you know, young people are credited to, uh, you know, flipping seats all over the place. And so that, uh, elected officials are now accountable to young people and protecting our lives and protecting our futures. Um, and so I think that that really is going to sort of dictate the direction of our movement. Um, and then I also think, you know, I think that the digital, how we're harnessing digital tools is we're learning so much that we'll be able to 
um, utilize after um, and and sort of continue to utilize and how we organize and how what what we describe as the social movements and the tactics that we use, I think are gonna be forever altered by how people have been able to use digital technology and learn digital technology in a new way. And the last thing that I'll say around climate in particular and sort of how our movement is sort of where we're headed is that I think that once we, once conversations move on from sort of current COVID relief, which is where we've been for a really long time, because obviously we're, you know, many people are still, um, uh, you know, on in quarantine or on lockdown to a pretty extreme degree, depending on what state you live in. Um, but once we move on from that and talk about sort of infrastructure rebuild up and economic recovery and sort of how do we pull ourselves out of this recession, um, which I think is in a conversation that, you know, will happen later this year in 2021, I think that there's a real opportunity for climate and I think for climate and labor especially to work together and to form collaborations and partnerships so that when we recover from COVID, we do it in a way that's in align with the framework of the Green New Deal. Um, you know, something that I think isn't talked about enough right now is that how we got out of the Great Depression was the New Deal and that's what the Green New Deal is based off of. And so policies that, um, that, that, that uh, follow the, the framework of the Green New Deal in line with what labor is asking for in the creation of new jobs in, is the best possibility for us to pull ourselves out of this recession is going to be doing it through a green recovery. And so I think as we sort of continue right now and, and the summer of protest is that our energy is around movement for black lives and is around elections but again you know our, our win is a collective win it's a win for all of us for all of our issues and that's why we have to show up for each other and so i think that the energy we're seeing now is going to continue to build and build and um i think this is the time that over the next couple of years we're going to see you know what is the revolution that sort of we've been talking about that is this people revolution and i think it's going to be something that's going to encompass a lot of different issues and it's going to be led by our generation Thank you, Katie. Rebecca, do you think that it'll take something major for people to finally take action? With the unique circumstances from COVID-19, do you think it will have similar impacts with that of the BLM movement? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so something major, I'm assuming, refers to a major um, climate impact or climate-linked disaster. Um, I actually want to just reframe the question a little bit. Um, I think, you know, as many of us may know, um, there's already hundreds of thousands of people around the world suffering the worst possible consequences of climate change and the climate emergency each year, whether that's famine or displacement or, or uh, drought. Um, and there's already been numerous um, climate-linked disasters um, in the U.S. already. Um, I, I actually think that this is, this is really related to um, the importance of the movement for Black lives right now. This question is, is really linked um, because um, based on how the climate emergency impacts frontline communities disproportionately, disproportionately people of color, um, low-income people, people with disabilities. Um, I think that these major events are happening and I think it's a question of what it will take um, for them to register and hit home um, with people who are not impacted with society collectively um, in the same way. And we've seen with, with this moment that what it takes, that, that it has taken a mass uprising um, for, for that to happen. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a question of these major events happening is also a question of how organizers are able to respond. Thank you, Rebecca. Katie, do you have anything you want to add? Um, no, I think I think Rebecca said it said it really well. I think that the sort of to what Rebecca was saying is that I think that the 
like people are, when we talk about an existential threat, I think people understand it a lot more now. And I think, I also think we'll continue to like now the next crises that do happen with climate, I think are going to remind people about what's happening with COVID and they're going to feel that emergency in a similar way. I remember talking with um, a few organizers that um, sort of had did a lot of organizing post the California wildfires right at the beginning of COVID. And they talked about how, um, you know, like how, what people experience during the wildfires is how people feel during, like at the beginning of COVID where everyone's kind of freaking out and there's this mass panic. And I think that's, going to be like people are going to start to draw those comparisons and i think people are going to start to understand that if we can act on COVID in the way that we did most countries um then we can act on the on and addressing climate in the same way and so i'm hoping that those can those those comparisons will be be drawn as well but i think also over the last few years these trigger moments like you know the death of george floyd that was a trigger moment um, the shooting in Parkland, that was, a, that was a trigger moment. Trump getting elected was a trigger moment. So all of these things that have sort of happened that sort of trigger this kind of energy, I think that those build and build and build. And that's why earlier I was talking about how I think it's, you know, I think it's this kind of this revolution that we're building toward is something that is bigger than just one issue because I think it's sort of one thing happening, layering and layering, layering, that is sort of building, especially in young people and in our generation, is sort of building this energy to say, okay, everything needs to change. And in order ever, for everything to change, we need to take back the power. And so I think um, in many ways, I think that we're going to see kind of this energy um, kind of trickle off into sort of all different corners of, of the work that we do really for the rest of our, our lives. I think this is a completely like the last four months is a totally society changing um, four months that I think are completely change, like changing the direction of, of the course of the country and, and the world as we know it. Thank you, Katie. Rebecca, what action can we take participate in for climate change right now during quarantine? Um, you know, I think um, in terms of action for climate change, um, I know there's organizing work that Jen Cleo um, is participating in around the local campaigns um, and, and that group's work. I would encourage folks to join that. Um, we at the Climate Mobilization also have a couple options I mentioned earlier around, you know, the option of plugging in to hold an online discussion group um, or to hold uh, to work with us on planning an action to push members of Congress um, around the climate emergency. But I would, you know, for right now, for this moment, I really want to lift up again the importance of joining in the Movement for Black Lives um, weekend of action at 619 um, this Friday through Sunday. And um, recap that there are options, I under, as I understand it, for folks to participate from home. Um, for those of you who may have, you know, reasons that you can't uh, go out. Um, there's options to, to plug in from home. Um, and I think in terms of your campaigns, your work through Gen Clio, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot that can be done around holding online rallies, um, as Katie's work showed us so well through Earth Day Live, um, whether something large scale or something smaller. Um, there's a lot that can be done around online petitions, call-ins, um, email in, letter letter writing in, um, in, and a lot around relationship building and planning as well uh, to set us up for, for our campaigns to succeed. Thank you, Rebecca. Katie, is Future Coalition looking for volunteers? Um, we, our model is not like a quite a volunteer model. We, oh, we, when folks want to sort of help and work with us, we, um, find definitely ways to plug them in, but because of sort of how we're structured, we, um, do sort of support organizers that are sort of doing organizing work. So a lot of times if folks say, come to us and say they want to get involved, we'll plug them in with what's happening locally. So our sort of first initial thing is what, you know, plug in to what's happening locally, but definitely see us as a resource if you're looking, trying to figure out where to start, or um, if you want more folks to work with, or just sort of 
any kind of areas of support and need. We've definitely heard most things before and have, have, have figured out ways to sort of support and plug folks in. So um, yes, we don't, not explicitly are we looking for volunteers, but if you're looking for something to do or, um, um, or a way to get involved, we definitely can sort of help find, find where, where is best to plug you into. Thank you, Katie. Rebecca, is the climate mobilization looking for volunteers? Yeah, so I mentioned our teams um, a moment ago around uh, the team that's putting on discussions around the climate emergency, the team that's planning actions. Um, we do also have volunteer openings listed on our website. If you go to climatemobilization.org, um, we accept folks as volunteers for our operations as an organization. Um, and we'd be really excited if any of you were interested um, in applying. But I will say, like, I think the most important thing to do is actually to be involved in local organizations that are doing this work. And I think Jen Cleo um, is, is doing fabulous, um, incredible work and um, just really excited about everything uh, that Jen Cleo is cooking up around the state of Florida. Thank you, Rebecca. Now we're going to wrap up our Q&As and I'm just going to finish it off with this last question for the both of you. I'll start with Katie. Um, just something quick. What do you want people to take away from this webinar? I'd say just given the moment that we're in, I think the importance of, of showing up. I think that, again, I think the connectiveness of our fights is, is more than ever now is so true. I think in this moment of COVID-19 and just everything that's happened over the last few months, I think that the power that we have collectively by coming together and working together and showing up for each other is so strong. Um, and also that we're up against a really, really, you know, uh, we're, we're up against a, a big force that does not want us to win and does not want, you know, um, um, justice and equity and inclusion and diversity to to be what what wins. Um, but I think, you know, we saw it yesterday with the Supreme Court ruling. I think that, you know, that has 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 um, re-inspired me um, to, you know, to show us that, you know, we, what we're working for is is about people and, and that means it has to come for the people. And so I think showing up for each other and each other's movements. And right now that means the movement for black lives, I think, is 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 what it's going to take to win, um, because, again, I think we are. Our, our win is a collective one and then it's not about one issue especially when talking about climate is we touch climate touches everything and so we've got to start at the roots and and this country was built off of of racism and capitalism colonialism which means that's where we have to start um and so i think right now is showing up for movement for black lives is the best thing that we can be doing um and it's the most impactful thing and then I would say just voting in the election and 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 getting that historic youth voter turnout is is the is the thing. So registering to vote and showing up for movement for Black Lives, I'd say, are my two um, are my two takeaways for today. Thank you, Katie. What about you, Rebecca? I want to really lift up everything that Katie said and said so well. I agree a hundred percent. Um, I think another piece that I want to add in is just the importance of relationships and relationship building to this work. Um, I think sometimes it can be hard to be stuck behind screens and to be stuck in our houses. And sometimes we can let that uh, be a barrier to building the relationships that we need to build and to really taking the time that we need to be present with people to be thoughtful and to be planful. Um, and so I think one, one addition is um, just building relationships, uh, slowing down and moving with thoughtfulness and intention. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Katie. I also just want to make a quick announcement that the Clio Institute is a nonpartisan organization and the political views of our panelists does not reflect Clio. I also recommend that all of the audience at this webinar today do their own research to see what politics align with their own values. With that being said, I'm going to give this to Sabrina to talk about her own experience with Jen Clio and wrap up the webinar. 
I just want to thank everyone again for joining us. I found out about Clio Institute at a networking event about a year ago. Um, knowing about and seeing the effects of climate change really pushed me to join Gen Clio, and it's been a really great experience. And I encourage all of you to join our Gen Clio program. And you can see the link in the chat box. Um, we are always accepting new members. And Clio has many webinars coming up over the next few weeks as part of our webinar series. Um, our next Gen Clio statewide meeting is on July 1st, and we are launching a Gen Clio chapter in Tampa. The links are also on our website. Um, and then Katrina will send the links. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day and please stay safe. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Thanks so much.